There's no question that many people are skeptical about the Christian God. But for the fundamentalists who believe in the infallibility of the Bible, I have a question for you. Is that God presented in your book really good? Stay tuned and I'll tell you why I think he isn't. Now this video was pretty easy to make because it doesn't require any research. Just an array of thoughts on items about the biblical God that I've been contemplating for decades. Inquiries that I don't think fundamentalist Christians or even non-fundamentalist Christians even bother to think about. And that is, is the Christian biblical God really that good? Now my concept as a theist, an unspecified theist at that, which many will claim is just a cowardly atheist, but would be that the higher power I think of is a far distant cousin from the one I read about in the Bible. As a matter of fact, I can't think of any religion that's great for mankind, since the basic premise of all of them is fear. And it makes me wonder if religion wasn't perhaps invented way back when, partly as consolation for their future deaths, but mostly for way of those in power to control their subjects beneath them, however primitive their subjects may have been. Let's turn back to the Christian God, the one that the fundamentalist believes is portrayed exactly as the Bible states, word for word. Well, first of all, that God is all-knowing and all-powerful. He knows his timeless past, is omnipotent in the present, and has his crystal ball for the future as well. And it makes you wonder, why would that God create an earth which is filled with such suffering to begin with? Now, it is stated in Genesis that actually we caused that suffering because Eve had to snack on an apple thanks to that trickster serpent. But it seems to me that that contention lies between God and his fallen angel Lucifer, in which he decided to put humans in the middle of during his playground squabble because he certainly didn't equip his children with enough sense to outwit a mere talking snake. So it makes you wonder, was mankind created just for his amusement so he could sit back and watch and see who would go to him and who would fall to his enemy? And if they did fall to that enemy that he created, that enemy that was created because of his ancient battle with him, then he sticks him in the lake of fire for eternity. So he induces suffering in a mankind that he created, knowing full well that they were going to fail to begin with. Anyone else besides me seeing a little bit of injustice here? And then, this deficient race, whose descendants had nothing to do with Adam and Eve in original sin, are condemned in that sin, to the point where God decides to just wipe them all out, save one family. Enter the story of the Great Flood. He puts Abraham through the mental anguish of thinking he's going to have to gut his own son to show his loyalty to God. He turns Lot's wife into a pillar of salt simply for turning around when she wasn't supposed to. And as if the world wasn't bad enough on its own, he torments Job for decades just to see if he'll stay loyal. Now, the fundamentalist and the regular Christian will come out and say that God sent his only son, a man named Yeshua, who is going to do us all a solid by getting nailed to the cross in order to give us sanctuary from that original sin, which doesn't seem to help all the eons of people who existed before Jesus. But what's a little unfairness with the great Omega? But even with that, there's still a catch. You have to believe in him and his miracles and the claim that he rose from the dead. But the only people that could have possibly witnessed this were narrowed to the Galilee and Jerusalem area. And if we don't happen to believe this little fable, we can join all those lost souls in that heated lake once again. And the only thing we have to go by is a theological scrapbook of which we don't even know who the authors were. And then to add insult to injury, God creates us with a rational and thinking mind. The type of mind that's not going to believe something unless there's evidence presented to do so. And what evidence did he leave us? That shoddy theological piece of work just mentioned known as the Bible. And if God's supposed to be a superior being, it begs the question, why didn't he do a better job with this work? You have a God who claims to be good, but yet propagates slavery in Old and New Testament. You have the Jesus presented in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which is a completely different person than the one presented in John. You have nothing even transcribed until approximately 50 to 100 years after Christ's death. It didn't even put in one eyewitness account of someone who was there and actually witnessed the reappearance of Christ. If you're going to tell us that we have to rely on something completely out of faith, 
backed by a book that a fundamentalist claims is the infallible word of God, then that book shouldn't be contradicting itself all over the place, which is going to make us think that its chapters aren't authentic, aren't reliable, and aren't the word of God at all. You give us this shoddy manual, whose components were written in bits and pieces over time, by various authors that we don't know, whose final product was organized by a small yet powerful group of men, the very same men that we know are prone to mistakes and corruption for their own gain, if we don't believe every word of it, then we're condemned to hell. Makes me say that God hasn't learned much about justice since the Old Testament, and it seemed that God helped everybody along in the Old and New Testament in maintaining that belief system toward him by all these various apparitions and miracles. Spoke to Abraham, spoke to Moses, reappeared to all the apostles, even put up with a few minutes of doubting Thomas's obstinance when he still didn't believe him as he was standing right in front of him. Walked on water, cured the blind, and raised the dead. Fed a crowd with a couple of fish and loaves of bread, and kept the party going at the wedding of Canaan when they were running short on beverage. Revealed himself to 500 more people, even set to write by direct revelation to a merciless killer named Saul. So if you had that direct evidence way back when, I guess you would be a knucklehead not to believe. But what about all of us 2,000 years later? Not only have we not seen one direct intervention, not even a flicker of flame on a leaf on our apple tree in the backyard, but neither have our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, or anyone as far back as anyone can remember. So are we just supposed to believe that God was too preoccupied to deal with present generations? Because it seems that 2,000 years later, it'd be appropriate now to maybe give us a reminder of his presence. So we have this terribly shoddy manuscript and an absentee landlord. But if we don't buy this fundamentalist version of the father who stepped out of the house and never came back due to the use of our rational mind that he gave us, then he's going to show us how much he loves us by sending us to hell. And this is why I had to move away from Christianity. Not just the fundamentalism, but the various regular Christian churches as well. Because I've done an incredible amount of research on the legitimacy of the Bible. But as I've shown in this episode, you don't have to spend a few hundred hours reading about it. Just sit back and think one day, does this God really make sense to you? But if you'd like to read a story about what I think it'd be like if Christ ever actually returned to Earth, check out my novel The Second Fall. An offbeat apocalypse sure to offend the fundamentalist. On Amazon, see the link in the video description in the banner, and I will see you next time as we once again take the sword of reason and reality and thrust it right through the heart of ignorance.